Good morning, BCF. So uh, I think it's our last 90 degree day in the valley. Is that, is that true? Uh, maybe. We'll see. I'm looking forward to, to cooler weather. I don't know about you. Um, especially being from Iowa, fall, uh, as Navine, our daughter, puts it, I want fall to land on me. <laughs> That's what we feel too. Let's turn our Bibles to Philippians. We're going to finish up chapter 1 today, so uh, turn to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 18. Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. But what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This will be a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray again. Father, I need your power this morning to be able to speak this truth clearly. Please use the gifts that you've given me. Please use my mouth. Please use my mind. Please use my heart. I want to speak this truth in a way that doesn't just make sense to us, but it, it makes us want to move and live this out. God, I'm so grateful for the way that you spoke to me this week. Through your word, through its power, it's been transforming my heart, and I pray that it would do the same for this congregation at BCF. We love you, God. We trust you, and we can't wait to hear from you this morning. Pray by the power of the Spirit you would speak to us. Amen. So you've probably heard this before, to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's probably one of the most quoted scriptures. Um, but it sounds like, in fact, my brother has a tattoo of this in Icelandic, to live is Christ, to die is gain. It sounds like something you might put on your wall or on your fridge. But what does it actually mean? How, what does it mean to live is Christ and to die is gain? Well, this morning, that's exactly what I want to talk about and want to focus on. Um, and, uh, oh, not yet, Dallas Willard. So, I was asked to teach Sunday school about, uh, sort of been maybe 11 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, when Natalie and I were attending the E-Free Church in Atlantic. And I love nothing more than a good escape. I think you've heard me say this before. Uh, the Count of Monte Cristo is, is just one of the most amazing escape stories. Don't want to give too much away, but you should definitely read it or just watch the movie uh, if you can't read. And in Sunday school I, that I was teaching, I didn't, <laughs> this is terrible, I didn't really want to go to church after Sunday school because we had Sunday school and then we had big, big service. I didn't really want to, to go to church. And so I had this idea that if I opened the window and jumped out the window, that I could make it to my car and I could just leave before service. I was young, rebellious, and I also convinced the person who was teaching Sunday school with me 
that if we left early, that maybe we could go on a date. <laughs> and so, with the help of one high school student who shut the window behind us, we jumped out the window and we went to the parking lot and nobody saw us and we went on a date and it was awesome. I won't tell you who that person was. I love a good escape. But so does our culture. Our culture loves escape. That's something I want to talk about this morning. Um, I meet up with a good friend, Zach DeMarcus. He's, where are you, Zach? Raise your hand. Oh, he's right there. I love talking with Zach because he helps me to think through the scriptures in a way that I haven't, perhaps. And if you don't have a friend like that, I highly recommend getting a friend who helps you think through the, the scriptures in a different way. And as I was uh, kind of talking through what I was going to be preaching this week, he reminded me of a Dallas Willard quote. Dallas Willard, who's a, a famous theologian and author, was once asked, what is the gospel? And he said, well, I'll tell you what the gospel is not. The gospel is not how to get to heaven after you die. And so the interviewer said, well, well what is it then? And he said, well, it's, it's actually how to get to heaven before you die. How to get to heaven before you die. And here's what Dallas Willard went on to explain. You see, so many people have this idea that you want to share the gospel with people or the gospel is shared with you so that you can go to heaven, that the ultimate goal is just to go to heaven. It's, it's like, a, as another friend this week put it, it's like a get out of hell free card. You believe that Jesus is your savior and then that's kind of it. You pray a prayer, you, you know, maybe you go to church or something like that, but you've got your get out of hell free card and now I can go to heaven. My salvation is secure, and now I can live how I want. And Dallas Willard says, no. The endeavor of the believer is to be a disciple of Christ in your life right now. You are rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the glorious kingdom of light so that you can live as a citizen of the kingdom right here, right now, bringing the gospel to bear sharing the gospel with your neighbors, believing that your salvation is secure and that heaven is the goal that you are running toward. But the world's a pretty bleak place to live. Am I right? That you just read the news, look at your own life perhaps, your own struggles, uh, your own suffering. The world's really dark. And the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, wrote a book called Ecclesiastes. It's a real page turner if you want to read it sometime. But I just wanted to read um, some of his words. The words of the teacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. This, this is Solomon in Ecclesiastes. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, and yet the sea is never full to the place the streams come from where they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear the fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything to which someone can say, look, something new? It was already here long ago. It was before our time. No one remembers the former generations. Even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. But this is, this is how the world is, quite honestly. This is how the world is. In fact, Paul in Philippians, later in chapter 3, uh, later in chapter 2, he says, our generation is crooked and depraved. Mind you, this is 2,000 years ago. I think it's easy for us to think, oh man, look at our world. It's such a mess. It's, it's, it's the worst it's ever been. Maybe. But, it, you know, at least uh, they're not entertaining themselves by killing people in an amphitheater, like gladiator style. We're doing evil just in other ways. 
There's nothing new under the sun. Solomon was incredibly wise and right. It's true. Evil is just done in different ways. The world is a very dark place, and I think that most of us long for an escape. We want to get out of here. We, we long to go somewhere beautiful. Um, I was talking to the field houses at a, a party this weekend, and they said for their 25th, 25th anniversary, they went to St. Lucia. Uh, it's an island in the Bahamas, I believe. Yeah. And I, I actually didn't really know where it was or what it looked like, so I looked it up, and I saw this picture, and I was like, whoa, that is amazing. I want to escape there. <laughs> I want it to be my 25th wedding anniversary. I want to talk about something that I think is pretty pervasive all over the place in our culture. And it's this idea of escapism. Escapism, wanting to get out. All of us experience this at some point. In uh, this passage, did I cut out for a second? Paul, in this passage in Philippians, is saying, what shall I choose? I, I long to be with Christ. Look at the suffering I'm experiencing. I'm in jail. What I want to argue this morning is that Paul, even though it seems like he has this struggle between death and life, he accentuates what living right here in the moment means, and that escapism isn't the way to do it. So let's look at escapism. I actually broke it down into three categories, but it could be, there could be much more than this. So the first one I'm going to call the Luddite. The Luddite. Uh, Ned Ludd, uh, Luddite was a guy in the early 1800s who was in the textiles industry. And this is when the uh, Industrial Revolution was in full swing in the textile industry. And he knew that he was going to lose his livelihood. So he and a band of his you know, friends got these axes and they went in to a factory with all of these machines, and they destroyed all the machines. There! Now we can get rid of all technology. It's not how that works. The Luddite is someone who hearkens to yesteryear. And what they're trying to escape is change. They're trying to escape all the things that are changing in the world. Oh, I just long for the good old days. I, I really wish that the internet didn't exist. I really wish that we didn't have cell phones. I wish that we didn't have forward-facing cameras. I, I fall into this category. I'm, I'm a Luddite. I constantly try to escape this way. I dream about being in a day and age when there was no cell phones, no internet, and um, you could wear a, a jerkin and it wouldn't be laughed at. Uh, or, or, you know, breeches. I just read Rip Van Winkle and I was like, man, I wish I could dress like that. I'm kidding, I never will do that at church. And so they long for the good old days, and they tend, they tend to glorify the past. Ah, things were just the way that they used to be. That's what's wrong with the world. We, we just need it to be the way things used to be. And so what they do, because of this escapism, is they tend to insulate and isolate themselves from the world. They create a safe bubble so that the world can't get to them. Well, what does the scriptures have to say about this? James, for example, says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Isn't it the selfish desires that wage war in the members of your body? Doesn't it come from within you? It's easy to see all the sin out there and forget about the sin in here. And wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> it will follow you. And Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, he says, Not that I've already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on forward to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken a hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul says, if you look behind, you're going to get stuck. You're going to think that things were better back then. And maybe some of them were. But you will, what you'll do is you'll reject 
and not be able to engage with the current culture and the world around you, and you will lose your ability to speak gospel truth to people right here, right now. This, this form of escapism is dangerous. There's another form of escapism. It's one of my favorite memes. How do you do, fellow kids? I call this one forever young. Forever young. And what's, I was going to call it Ponce de Leon. You guys know who Ponce de Leon is? The, the Spanish explorer who tried to find the fountain of youth? Remember? He thought it was in Florida, which, I don't know, maybe it is. That's kind of where people end up. But uh, <laughs> escape or entropy. People are wanting to escape entropy. You guys know what that word means? I like words, by the way. Entropy is when things deteriorate. All things in the whole world experience entropy. If you don't maintain your house in Iowa every year, like painting, fixing things, maintaining things, it will fall apart. And all the abandoned houses in Iowa are black and white. It's weird. They look like a black and white photo. Entropy. Our bodies, our minds experience falling apart. And the person who is wanting to escape by being forever young has some unhealthy habits. They tend to be obsessed with their body image and their appearance. They try to escape the aging process. Now, some of these, these things are healthy. But you can also become anxious and obsessed with your health to the point where you are unhealthy. In fact, I know some people who are obsessed with their health by what they eat and the things that they do to their body. And they're some of the most anxious people I know. Anxiety causes some serious health issues. And I always thought also in the state of California, instead of putting the sticker, you know, this may cause cancer in the state of California, I think they should just only put things that don't cause cancer because I feel like they can save themselves a lot of stickers. You know, just like, this thing miraculously does not cause cancer. And they tend to, this, per, this kind of person tends to build a personal kingdom of comfort. They're driven by comfort because they want to escape the discomfort and the reality of the world. Another kind of person, this is just a, oh, sorry, I actually want to give biblical <laughs> reasons why this is a bad idea. So 1 Timothy 4.8 says, For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. The Bible tells us that you're not going to escape entropy. You're not going to escape aging. And yes, it's good to take care of your body. You should. You should take care of your physical health and, and your well-being. But if it becomes your God and it becomes your obsession, it's dangerous. It, it's, it has a value. But focusing on your godliness your holiness, becoming like Jesus, allowing him to be the center of your attention and the things that you orient your entire life around, that has value eternally, forever. And also, Paul reminds us later in Philippians that Jesus is going to transform your lowly body so that it will be like his glorious body. You will get a body in the new heavens and the new earth when Christ reigns as king eternally, forever and ever. He will make your body like his body to withstand all of eternity, and you will be able to partake of the tree of life. That's exciting. There's another kind of person. Um, and I couldn't really decide what picture I was going to use, but I thought this one was fitting. The person who's stuck in the fantasy world. Uh, I've kind of got gotten progressively darker with these versions of escapism. And I, I think this one is uh, not quite the darkest, but certainly getting close. This person's just simply trying to escape reality. This is the kind of person who loves a good Netflix binge, loves to play video games. They're, they're a gamer, and they love to play for hours and hours on end. The person who is binge-watching YouTube this is a person who can become easily addicted. Substance abuse, drugs, alcohol, all in the name of escaping the realities of their life. Wanting to escape what is right in front of them by partaking in something that will take them out of the moment. This also includes sexual fantasy and life on the internet. 
doom scrolling on your phone, looking for you don't even really know what, becoming addicted sexually to things online and to pleasing yourself when you're all alone. All of these things are so dangerous because the scriptures tell us this. Later in Philippians, Paul tells us, for I, I've told you often with tears, and I tell it to you again, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame because their mind is on earthly things. If you're so wrapped up in the suffering of this life, the trouble and the hardship and the darkness of this life, and you're seeking escape through fantasy, you're behaving as an enemy of God. You are going the same route that the world goes to escape the darkness of the world by seeking your own salvation through fantasy, through fiction, through addiction of substances, things that can change the chemical balance of your body so that you don't feel the world around you. It's dangerous because you're acting as an enemy of God. Okay, so, so how do I escape? I still want to get out of here. I still don't want to experience the pain that I'm experiencing, the suffering that I'm experiencing, the things that have happened to me, the things that are happening to our world. How do we escape? Well, I think we need to remember what the theme of Philippians is. What is the theme of Philippians? Anybody remember? We're going to move forward through the toil of life with joy in our hearts because we have hope. We're citizens of heaven. We have to be reminded that we're citizens of heaven. That our hope is secured. Um, I wanted to show you a, a clip from a movie that I love. It's a classic movie. movie. Maybe some of you have seen this. He really must be a wonderful wizard to live in a city like that. Oh, come on, then. What are we waiting for? Nothing. Let's hurry. Yes, let's run. <laughs> he really must be a wonderful wizard if he lives in a city like that. He must be a wonderful king if he rules the entirety of the world with his grace and mercy and love. And he lives in a city built for his people. God is a great and mighty king, and his kingdom is forever. And if you have Jesus Christ reigning and ruling in your hearts, you will reign and rule beside him forever in the new heavens and the new earth in his kingdom. But his kingdom isn't just over there. His kingdom has begun in your hearts. And just like the four seeing the Emerald City they were inspired and they looked at one another and they said, let's hurry. Let's run this race to get to the Emerald City. We as citizens of heaven are on a race. Paul thinks of it like this. He says in Acts chapter 20, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task of the Lord Jesus that he's given me, the task of testifying the good news of God's grace. We want to testify to this good news to everyone that we meet as we're running. But what happens to those people? The lion and the tin man, the scarecrow and Dorothy. They end up in a field of poppies. Remember the Wicked Witch? Poppies. <laughs> poppies will make them sleep. And they end up falling asleep in this poppy field. Well, the trouble and the sorrow and the suffering and the death all around us, it's, it's like we're in a field of poppies. We just want to go to sleep and escape it all. We just want to get out of it. I, you know, I think for me, it, it's probably 
learning how to love other people's dogs, <laughs> and love and accept other people's, you know, that, that's my struggle. Please. <laughs> Puppies will make Casey lose his uh, marbles. I, I have a hard time loving dogs. I'm only saying that I'm making fun of Lorraine because she said she wanted to bring her puppy to church. So, no, you cannot bring your dog to church. The, the suffering in life makes us forget that we're on this race to the celestial city, as John Bunyan would have it in the Pilgrim's Progress. We are on our way to the kingdom of God, but we have a job to do right here and right now. Let's look at what Paul says. He says, now, my brothers, I want you to know that what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel in in verse 12. Then in verse 18, he says, I'm going to continue to rejoice. Even though I am in prison, I will rejoice. For I know, verse 19, that through your prayers and the help given by the spirit of Jesus Christ, What has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. So how do you escape the world? How do you get out of this? Well, it's it's in this phrase where Paul says to live as Christ and to die as gain. Verse 20, he says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live as Christ... And to die is gain. So what does that even mean? To live is Christ. Well, here's what I think it means. It means you don't try to escape the hardship of life. It means that you embrace it. Because you're certain of your deliverance. You embrace the hardship of life because you are so certain that your deliverance is sure. Well, what is your deliverance? Your deliverance is your salvation. And let's think of this. Do you remember what the word Christ means? We talked about this at the very beginning when we talked about the theme of Philippians. And you see the word Christ 37 times in this book. Christ means anointed one. Christ the high priest. Christ the prophet. Christ the king. It means that the foreground of your mind, you know that you will be delivered from the hardship of life because of Christ. He is your high priest. The one who intercedes between you, your sin, and a holy God so that you can have a relationship with the holy God because he makes you holy. He is our prophet who speaks the truth to our hearts through the power of the scriptures and his word, the word made flesh when Christ came to earth. He's given you the Holy Spirit so that when the word is in your eyes and in your head, you can understand the scriptures and then live them out. Christ is our king who reigns supreme over all things, who conquered sin and death on the cross. Christ is Lord. He is the one we look to, and he is our deliverer. We can be certain of our deliverance and embrace the suffering in life, and we don't have to try to escape it. We can actually live through it, seeing the goal at the end of the race to which we press on forward, as Paul says, heavenward, that's our goal. But we know that right here, right now, we have a job to do. We have the gospel to proclaim. This is so interesting. Paul's phrase here where he says, I know this will result in my deliverance. He's quoting someone. Do you know who it is? He's quoting someone who is so severely suffering that he wasn't certain he could go on, yet he did. It's Job. Listen to what Job says in chapter 13, verse 12 through 19. He says to his friends, keep silent, because they've been giving him terrible advice, especially his wife. Curse God and die. Keep silent, he says, and let me speak. And then let come to me what may. Why do I put myself in jeopardy and take my life into my hands? Because though he slay me, I will yet hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to the face of the Lord. Indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance. For no godless person would dare come before him. Do you know why God allowed Job to suffer? He was wanting to show Satan that this guy, Job, 
He doesn't love me because I bless his life and keep him from hardship and give him a comfortable existence. He loves me because he knows me. He knows who I am. Go ahead, Satan. Do your worst to Job. He will praise me. He will glorify me. He will believe me. He knows that I am his deliverer. Have you considered Paul, my servant? Do whatever you want to him. The gospel's going to go forward through him. Think of yourself. Think of your own circumstances and your own situation. Are you being considered to be worthy to share in the sufferings of Christ so that you could be made an example of? Look how they trust in Christ and declare it to the world. This is why Paul says, I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus that, that what has happened to me, me being in prison, I eager, eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed. When I stand before Festus and I have to give an account of the gospel, I'm not going to water it down. I'm going to say it exactly as it is, even though I know that means certain death for me. I'm not going to water it down. I'm going to say it as it is. Why do I take my life into my hands like this? Just as Job says, because I know it will prove to be my deliverance. I will be delivered either in this life because my salvation is secure or by my death. To live is Christ. To die is gain. It's a win-win situation. So... <laughs> It's great to, to think of it like this because that, that's what the Bible's telling us. That's what Paul wants us to know. But how do you actually do that? How do you actually live like that? If this is what it means, you don't try to escape the hardship of life, but you embrace it and you, you live to please Christ, you know that your salvation is secure. How do you actually do it? I got to tell you one last story. There, there was a guy... His name was Jamie Zach, and it, this was when we lived in Exira. Now, I don't really enjoy sports ball, but at the football games, he, he was a massive man, like a mountain of a man. And at the football games, he had a son, Nelson, who was a football force to be reckoned with. And he, he was in uh, the stands. His dad, Jamie, was in the stands. He's this huge man. And whenever they would get a first down, he would stand up, and I don't even know how his voice could get this loud, but it hurt my ears. And he would say, first and ten, do it again. And the whole crowd would go bananas. And they would go, first and ten, do it again. You know, the whole town, like all 30 of us. And it was amazing. This, <laughs> th this whole crew of people, and they were all driven to a frenzy by this one guy, this one big dude. Do you have friends like that in your life who's your cheerleader? Who when you're suffering, when you feel like, why is God allowing this to happen to me? 